Please be seated as I pray. Father, what a blessing it is to sing a song that describes the desire of your son to save the church and the response of the church to his saving work on the cross. Lord, when he purchased us to purchase us away from sin, to secure us in our salvation for a life eternal with you. I pray that as we take this time in our service to remember him, that you would grant us your grace, the grace we need so desperately to be able to see your son in the pages of scripture. So Lord, I pray that you would attend to our hearts. I pray that you would attend to our minds. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning for our time around the Lord's table, we are going to be looking at a passage that describes Jesus' desire and his willingness to go through the work of crucifixion for all of those who would put their trust in him as their Savior and as their Lord. So if you have a Bible, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 26? We're going to be looking at the story of Jesus' betrayal by Judas. We're going to be looking at verses 47 through 50 together. If you don't have a Bible, there are some men who are going to be coming down the aisle. Simply raise your hand and they will get a copy of God's Word to you. If you don't actually own a Bible, please consider this as our gift to you so that you can begin reading God's Word for yourself. The setting here is that Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. The 11 disciples are with him. He has taken Peter and James and John aside and Jesus has been praying for what he knows is is coming. And he is speaking to them, and he is telling them that his arrest is very imminent. So we're going to read verses 47 through 50, and as we do that, let's look at two things. Let's look at the way that Jesus interacts with Judas, and Judas's interaction with Jesus, and then look at Jesus' response to Judas' interaction with him. Reading from verse 47. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas... One of the twelve came up, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs, who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said to him, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus, and they seized him. You see Judas' feigned interaction with Jesus in verse 49. He went to Jesus, and he says, Hail, Rabbi. That's an address of respect. That's an address where you place the one to whom you're speaking on a very high level. It's an address of veneration and love and affection. And Jesus, Judas is full of deceit at this point. And he draws up to Jesus and he kisses him. The kiss here is, is not the kind of kiss that was customary in their culture where one from a lower stature or standing would, would kiss the back of the hand or perhaps even the front of the hand of someone who had a higher stature, say a pupil to a teacher or an instructor. This was a kiss of affection, of love and devotion. It was an intensely personal kiss. Judas Judas drew near to Jesus, and he kissed him affectionately. All for the purpose of betraying him and identifying him to those who had come to arrest him. We see Jesus' response to that in verse 50. Jesus addresses Judas with the word friend. He uses the term friend. Now this term friend here does not identify a oneness. It does not identify a unity. It does not identify a passion and a likeness for one another or a similarity to one another. It's more of a term of a colleague or a comrade. Judas was one of the 12 disciples, and Jesus uses a term that identifies him as one who was one of the disciples, but not nearly at all as one who had a love and affection for him. But we see Jesus' commitment to do what he had been called to do by the Father, and he instructs Judas and gives him a clear instruction at the end of verse 50, and he says to him, Do what you have come for. Despite the heinous deed by Judas, despite the the deceit, despite the hypocrisy, despite all of the things that go into it, Judas knew why Judas did what he did. 
And we see that if you go back to verse 39 in the same passage here. Jesus was in the garden and he prayed for quite some time. He prayed and on three occasions he, be, he came back to Peter and James and John and he told them, you should not be sleeping. Pray because the spirit is willing, the body is weak. He knew exactly what was in front of him. He was preparing himself for the worst trial that a person could ever experience. He was actually preparing himself to receive in his own body God's anger and wrath against everybody who had put their trust in him. It was so bad that Luke's account tells us that his sweat became like drops of blood as it fell to the ground. Uh, but God sent an angel to care for Jesus and to prepare him and to strengthen him and solidify him for the work that was ahead. So Jesus, despite being betrayed by Judas, despite all of the deceit and all the hypocrisy, he was ready to do what was in front of him, and he was prepared to die, even if it meant enduring the humiliation of being betrayed by one of your closest friends. If you're here today and you are one of those who has called Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord, and your life indicates that he truly is your Master and your Lord, we want you to remember Jesus with us this morning. I want you to take the elements when they come to you and hold them, and remember Jesus and his willingness to go to the cross for you, to endure in his own body God's judgment against you so that you could be reconciled to God through the work of Jesus on the cross in your place. When you've prepared your heart, take the elements on your own. I want to speak for a few minutes to those of you who are here who do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. I want you to do that. To see that, I want you to look at the way Jesus is described in the beginning of verse 47. Judas is described as one of the twelve. That just means that Jesus was with the group of disciples for three years. They walked together, they worked together, they served together, and Judas was right there with them, and he appeared just as one of the rest. Everybody looked to Judas as one of the disciples in the same way that they looked at everybody else. But Judas had no affection for Jesus. He had no desire for Jesus. He had no heart for Jesus. He didn't see Jesus as the Messiah. He saw Jesus as something very, very different. If you're here and you're in a family, a good family, a family that loves God, you have a mom and a dad who love Jesus Christ and they follow Jesus, and you're in that same family, I want you to be very, very careful when you, when you consider the opportunity that's before you. If you have followed Jesus and he made him your Savior and your Lord, then take these elements and take them well and remember him well. If your life does not indicate that you do not know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, simply take the elements and pass them by. And know that this is a really good opportunity to see what Jesus did and see him for who he is. This is a time for believers who have made Jesus their Savior and their Lord to remember him. So when the elements have come, please take them on your own when you're ready, and I'll pray.